Hi, everybody. We're just going to wait a few more minutes for um, everybody to join. But if you want to go ahead already and introduce yourselves in the chat, um, you can say a little bit about where you're joining from today, um, maybe what brought you to the session, your relationship with peatlands, wind turbines, anything you feel like sharing with people. Um, and we can just get that going while we wait a few more minutes. Okay, so I think I might go ahead and get a little bit started. I'm just in the introduction to start with, so if people are still coming in, that's fine. Um, oh yeah, hi Kieran. Um, yeah, ev everyone else, if you want to just write a short message in the chat, you can go ahead and just introduce yourselves a little bit. Uh, my name's Bethany, I'm going to be facilitating the session today. I'm a member of Repeat since the beginning, uh, and I've been working on the UK anthology series um, throughout the whole uh, idea um, and uh, it's really nice doing this session today because actually this was the spark of why we decided to do the whole series actually. Um, when um, Robert McFarlane had tagged us in a Twitter post drawing our attention back to a, a wind farm that was proposed to be built and then there was the campaign to stop it and some of that will be spoken about a little bit later anyway. Um, and then we thought oh what, what kind of thing can we do, what, how can we get involved and um, then we came up with this whole idea of how peatlands relates to various different other topics. Uh, so, so far we've done the introduction session, which we did in March, which was just to give everybody a little bit of an introduction to uh, peatland so that everyone could join if they hadn't already known a little bit about peatlands. And then we held the peatlands and forestry session. Uh, and there we were focusing on uh, the forestry developments that are being proposed and being created on peatlands, so obviously uh, damaging the peatland in the process and then kind of being presented as quite environmentally sustainable, however you can call it, uh, projects, and trying to bring in the nuance of this as well um, for everybody to start a discussion essentially. And then the next session was the climate and justice session, which is part of our wider peat fest. Uh, and there we are focusing a bit more on the UK trade relations with other countries such as Indonesia uh, and how that affects and interacts with peatlands as well. And essentially the aim from the whole series is just to explore a little bit how peatlands relates to different things, but also bring in a lot of the nuances that it's not so clear cut and we need to have these conversations a lot of times with a lot of different people just to kind of find out what are the best solutions and model through it a little bit. Um, so this session, uh, is then peatlands and wind turbines. Uh, and again, we want to focus a little bit on the nuance here of, um, of course, we're not presenting a view of being anti-wind turbine or this kind of thing. Um, we are, of course, in favor of renewable energy, but it's about kind of looking into what it means to be renewable. We need to have holistic approaches to this word and this concept, this notion. Uh, how does this relate to peatlands and how does it relate to wind turbines as well? Um, and we're aware this is also maybe quite a contentious or politicized discussion for a lot of people. So just a quick, I'm sure everyone's totally fine and totally on board with this anyway, but just a quick word to make sure that you're responding to each other in a respectful way and having quite an open discussion. Um, that would be really nice, of course. Um, and in particular, this session is looking at some of the creative responses to peatlands. And, um, to that end, we have John and Lewis here with us. So I'll just give a short introduction to them and then we're going to play a video before I pass over to them. Uh, so first, John McLeod is an artist and project curator for Anne Lanterre and his work explores the human entanglements with the natural world, uh, often using intangible cultural heritage, language and identity as tools to delve into place. And currently he's based in Bergen. 
um, taking part in a project, uh, a Nordic Scottish project called Ebb and Flow, but usually you can find him uh, on the Isle of Lewis. And then we have Lewis joining from Creative Carbon Scotland, who he joined in 2019. And he has a background in classical music, working as a composer of chamber music and opera, as well as teaching music in universities. Uh, and he has a background in environmental campaigning, including with Fossil Free, Divest Parliament, Friends of the Earth, and BP, or not BP. Um, and I think they'll maybe say a few more words about their work, of course, and about themselves a bit later. Uh, but we're going to start with a short video that we've made. Uh, and the video focuses not just on wind turbines, but a bit more of uh, wider energy usage and how that interacts with peatlands. And again, this is um, just to start the discussion, really, for how we can start to um, explore these topics a bit more holistically. Um, and that's why we kind of focus a bit more broadly with the video. Um, so I think Lucas is going to go ahead and share, and then you can write some responses in the chat. We always like to hear what you think of it. Um, oh, you don't hear me, Inga. Does everyone else hear me? Okay, cool. I, I don't know what happened, Inga, but I hope that you hear me in a minute. Um, and I hope you hear the video also. Um, so yeah, Lucas, if you want to go ahead and start sharing the video, and then if you have some uh, responses, yeah, please feel free to put them in the chat um, and let us know what you think. Peatlands and the energy system. As we should all know by now, our current consumption of fossil fuels is a climate injustice. But did you know that peatlands are also part of this very same energy system? As National Geographic says, peatlands are the forgotten fossil fuel. Although not strictly fossilised, peat takes so long to form that it's non-renewable in human lifetimes. On average, peat forms one millimetre a year, meaning that one metre of peat will have taken 1,000 years to form. In fact, peat is actually a precursor to coal, also consisting of dead organic matter. And yet the clear connections between peatlands and the energy system often goes unsaid. So let's say it. Here are five ways that peatlands directly interact with the global energy system of today. Number one, the burning of peat for energy. Peatlands, just like coal, oil and gas, contain dense amounts of captured carbon. Just like other fossil fuels, when peatlands are burned, this carbon gets re-released into the atmosphere in the form of CO2. Today, there are still power stations running on peat in different places in the world. Number two, peatlands are sites for fossil fuel extraction. An example of this is Western Siberia, which contains some of the largest peatlands on Earth. It also contains some of the most mismanaged oil and gas infrastructure on the planet. The pollution from this infrastructure not only destroys the local water and air quality, but also intensifies the thawing of the peaty permafrost, adding to climate change. Number three, peatlands are sites for wind turbines. When a wind farm is constructed on top of a peat bed and tremendous amounts of peat need to be removed for the large concrete stands. In Scotland this is a big issue with many local people protesting this development. Number four, peatlands are drained for biofuel. Did you know that palm oil, which creates biodiesel, is often planted on drained peatlands? The production of palm oil on peatlands means that the land subsides so much so that whole Indonesian villages are now sinking. And now for a new development. Number five, peatlands are being mined to create lithium batteries. Some researchers in Estonia have found a solution of using carbon from peat to create lithium batteries. But mining peat for lithium and destroying peatlands in the process means that this cannot be called renewable energy. It's clear that no matter our source of energy, there are complex issues to be tackled. 
This is the case when we're talking about traditional fossil fuels, but it's also the case when we talk about renewables being built on peatlands. Underlying all of this is that we simply cannot change our sources of energy without addressing the capitalist framework of growth, extraction and exploitation. We need to address inequalities and oppressions in society and deal with many of the root issues. For unless we deal with these, there will be no just transition. Okay, great, thanks Lucas. Um, so yeah, like I say, if you have anything that you want to add to the video or if you uh, want to have some responses, we can also speak about it a little bit later in the discussion as well. So you can just kind of keep them as well or put them in the chat, we'll be keeping an eye on it. Uh, and now I'm going to pass over to John. Uh, if you have any questions while he's speaking, just please feel free to put them in the chat. I uh, will be monitoring it throughout and then kind of pull some things to have a discussion with later. Uh, or if you have direct questions, we can also maybe have them directly afterwards at this time. Uh, and otherwise, I'll just pass over to you then, John. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Bethany. And thank you hugely to Repeat for uh, inviting me to, to speak about um, the, the, the campaign against the wind farm uh, proposal in Lewis, and, but also the, the artistic responses to that. And it's really encouraging to hear um, use the word holistic, um, looking at uh, climate change, land use and uh, land rights issues. I'm going to um, divide the talk into three sections, which is firstly a wee bit about the moor and the kind of cultural and kind of uh, ecological aspects about it. And secondly, about the, the actual proposal from AMEC for the wind farm and the response of the community to that. And uh, thirdly, um, the artists and writers responses to that. And just at the end, just any questions that people have to ask about what I've talked about in, 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 the, in these, these parts. Um, so I'll start with just photo of this is the uh, this is the village I live in I'm, I'm currently in Bergen but most of the time he, I'm here in the village of Braga on the west side of Lewis uh, this is a view from Ben Braga looking down to the village um, and and I don't know if you know Lewis so well but it's it's uh, it's kind of like Australia in a funny way it's like all the, the the human settlement is on the coast on the outside of the island and the interior is is mostly blanket bog um, and the proposal for the wind farm and the responses to it are about the north Lewis moor which is the, the north part of of the peat, the peat bog um, which constitutes one of the largest and most intact areas of blanket bog in the world and uh, I think it's probably Robert McFarlane who, who said it was he compared it to the Serengeti in terms of its ecological significance. It's uh, protected uh, as a UN Ramsar site, um, but it's also protected under the Bern Convention for its important bird populations. Uh, for example, it has 37% of UK's breeding Dunland population. And as the uh, proposal came in and other countries and organizations started responding to it. One of the objections actually came from the Icelandic government because a lot of their migratory birds use Lewis, the Lewis Moor as a refueling station. Uh, the, uh, the title Sexy Peat, it was a project initiated by Highland Print Studio. And I think um, there'd been so much talk about rainforests and carbon sinks in the past that uh, just felt it was uh, an overlooked aspect of climate change and carbon sinks and needed to be readdressed. And the wind farm created the opportunity to try and make that question and, and to highlight the fact that these were important areas. So the village of Braga, like many villages, has a combination. It's a crofting community, so it has a combination of a croft land, 
of Maha, the strip by the sea where the potatoes are planted, uh, peat banks, and also moorland and mountain grazing. And historically, that has been really important because the croft land is not sufficient to sustain the livestock and people's livelihoods. So in summer, the older people and the teenagers would take the cattle to summer houses. So these summer houses are still here. And um, show you a few more photos of them more. Summer houses are still here, they're, still, they're ruins. Um, but the, the older people and teenagers would spend uh, up to three months of the summer uh, out there. And for the teenagers, it was like a place of first love and romance and freedom. Um, but also they'd be coming backwards and forwards from the Sheeling to the village, bringing pails of milk. And the road that they took, it was just a path to the moor, but it was called the Radnabanagan, the road of the, the milkmaids or the, the milk collectors. So there would be a population of people on the moor throughout the summer, as well as all the wildlife. This is a grouse chick. So it was a very well-known landscape. And unlike perhaps some other peatland areas, the shielding tradition is still within living, living memory. So it's still a very current, uh, a current and known landscape. Um, and as well as its kind of natural beauty and ecological importance and diversity, it has a cultural and a land rights aspect for the people who live here. And some people have suggested that, that the Gaelic speaking crofting communities in these places are very like indigenous people that you might classify in other parts of the world. And I mean, the World Bank has talked about classifying certain aspects of what defines indigenous people, such as distinct social and cultural groups that share collective ancestral ties to the lands and natural resources where they live, or the land and resources on which they depend are inextricably linked to their identities, cultures, livelihoods, as well as their physical and spiritual needs, or that they still maintain a language distinct from the official language of the country they reside in. So all of these classifications that the World Bank uses to define indigenous people also apply to my neighbours in the crofting community that I live in. And their knowledge of the Moor goes back a long way through oral history, through intangible cultural heritage. So in the community, there are oral historians or shenahi, and one of the Shenahi I used to go and visit talks about how in the folk memory, uh, people understood that there were communities out on the moor. People were living out on the moor and moved to the coast. So if that's true, that makes that story over two and a half thousand years old from before the peat grew. So perhaps it's, it's worth actually looking at the people as being an important factor of who you protect because they're inextricably linked with the knowledge embedded in the land and also how to protect that. So a few years ago, we decided to put a roof on, on uh, my ex-partner's uh, family shielding. So this is a traditional shielding. Um, it has two doors, which you can block one of them up, depending on the prevailing wind. One whole back oval of the shielding is a bed, and the front has a, a, a bench that you can sit on and a fire. So this is the last probably remaining shielding, traditional shielding, um, as they used to be. And this was a, a neighbor who's now longer living. We went to stay with him in his shielding and he said, um, bring as many people as you like, it sleeps five. But he hadn't mentioned it was just one bed. Um, but he had his potato plot out there and also his clothesline and everything he needed. So this is Anne Campbell's family shielding and we 
we put a roof on this. This is us taking it, taking the roof off at the end of the summer. And you can see the niches there where people would store milk, um, basins of milk. And also they would make a bed out of heather or, or deer grass. Um, and the cattle would be all around them. They would have a, a stone called a clack takish, which was used for the cows to rub their backs on so that they didn't actually rub their back against the sheiling instead and disturb people. Um, and they say that the, the cattle knew when it was time to go home because the, of the smell of the burning bedding. So they would start heading back to the village of their own accord without the people because they knew that was the end of the summer sheiling. So it's a, actually interesting going back, this revisiting this time because it's something I've not really looked at for quite some time because it's 2004 that the AMEX scheme was put into application and proposal. It's one more sheeting picture. So it's, uh, it was a proposal for 234 wind turbines of 140 meter height. Uh, but what they didn't say was there were going to be 210 pylons 104 miles of road, nine substations, three super quarries for building the roads, and it would take 726 cubic meters of concrete needed for each turbine base. They were going to need 5 million tons of rock excavated from the ground to build the roads, and 2.5 million cubic tons of peat were going to be extracted to build the, the wind farm. This is for a 25 year lifespan of the wind farm, uh, which had been calculated which liberates more CO2 in its construction than it would save in that lifespan. So the people in the communities and a lot of the communities in Lewis strongly objected to, to this scheme. Uh, nobody had asked them if they were, if they had land could be used for that reason. Um, and a lot of people believe they had a moral right to look after that land, not only for themselves, but for other people and for global well-being of climate change. So people in my village set up a campaign group called the Munchoch Gunvailan, um, Moorland Without Windmills. Um, because the biggest wind farm in the world was about to turn up in their backyard and they didn't feel that they could do anything about it. The current, the sitting Labour government, despite having brought in legislation for communities to buy their land from the landlord, uh, supported the wind farm. Uh, both the MP and the MSP supported the wind farm. Um, 68 million pounds a year was uh, going to be taken as profit from this scheme with only 2% staying on the island for the population. But fortunately, the RSPB uh, officer at the time uh, also started a really strong campaign and through the European courts. AMEC declared that uh, the, the moor was actually waste ground. Um, so it was of no use to anyone. It was better to be utilized for wind farms. Um, AMEC are a company that were worked in uh, third world countries previously a lot, uh, but they also work with um, the disposal of nuclear waste. So that was another concern that the, the super quarries that were being built. The Lewis Rock, Lewis and Nice is very stable. Um, the, the fear was that um, the nuclear waste was also going to be dumped in these, these areas. Um, one thing we did do is, you know, contact all the conservation organizations at the time with varying degrees of success. It was 2004 and perhaps a kind of holistic and nuanced um, idea that not all wind farms were benign wasn't current. Uh, I contacted friends of, Earth, friends of the Earth Scotland um, about this issue in their back, back garden, really. But... Um, they said that they didn't have anyone available to comment. But when I looked on their website, they had a quite large campaign campaigning against uh, 
the destruction of peatland for palm olive in Indonesia. Um, so it seemed uh, for some reason it was too close to home and um, didn't actually comment at all on that. Survival International was slightly better. So Munchof Gunweilen and a lot of people in Lewis, um, they used all the skills that they had, the varying skills to campaign in different ways. So some people decided that they were going to strap dynamite to their tractors and drive into wind turbines if they were planted on the moor. But other people like my neighbor, and in this photo, he was big into his DIY. So he decided to build a wind turbine, a replica wind turbine and then set light to it. Um, and it just so happens that uh, iconic photographer from the National Press, a uh, Guardian and Independent, Moto McLeod uh, lives in the next door village. So he actually took photos of the turbines, the wooden turbine replica being set light to, which ironically, when we looked at them afterwards, it's been a symbol is hijacked by the Ku Klux Klan, but the original Highland call to arms was was Safari Cross. Um, so it seemed to have overtones of that about it. But this was actually a call to arms. And even though it was just ordinary people largely mounting this objection, um, it needed to happen. So the artist's response is to, to the wind farm where there's an idea initially um, set up by Highland Print Studio. Um, and myself and Anne Campbell were lead artists on the project. Um, so the idea was to, to work with print, print media uh, and to respond in various ways to the wind farm issue and to also celebrate them more. So these are just a few of my images from that time. Um, it's photopolymer etchings, exploring what it's like to walk out on the moor, what you see and observe, um, lived experience of actually being there. And this is one of uh, Anne Campbell's pieces. Um, she took a, a um, the starting point of the verse and songs and uh, law that's written about the moor. I think that was what made her and many people very angry that it was being considered a wasteland, but it was so well known and so well loved. Um, and some of these are, they kind of, the, the, the verses are almost like Nick Cave murder ballads. They're kind of Gallic lullabies and stories of Yakushka, the water horse, and they're quite amazing in their content. Um, but also she used things like in Gaelic, the different birds like the golden plover or the oyster catcher all say different things in Gaelic. So here she's uh, got the golden plover, which says uh, which is a hearty summer is, is coming. It was a sound that people loved to hear when the golden plover were first nesting. And at the bottom, this is uh, something her father said that uh, the place he most wanted to be and loved was, was the Ari, the, the Sheelin, the summer house. And she also made amazing maps of the moor um, to be told that uh, place is, is uh, wasteland just because it uh, doesn't have any uh, features which are, are are well documented um, in Gaelic. The printed page is called the memory of the white paper. So all of this material, most of it is in oral tradition. So this was probably the first time it had actually been um, brought to life in printed form. And the other thing she did, which Robert McFarlane picked up on, was to make a, uh, a glossary. Um, a collection of terms for for describing the moor or historical words of peat cutting, 
the title Radhanishan is the, the bird's road, which is uh, when you're cutting peats and you put the turfs up on the bank, there's a tiny strip of grass between the bank face and the cut peats. And that where they were called the bird's road. It's about four centimeters wide. And there's a lot of humor and amusement in the kind of Gallic naming. So she recorded names like Runoch Mern, which Robert McFarlane talks about, which is the scudding cloud shadow across the moor, like a kind of mackerel mark. So Runoch is a mackerel. Or Asta. Asta is the place that the sheep know as their own on the moor and go there. Uh, so you don't lose them. They know their own place. They have a territory like the people do with their shillings. Or Clach Eklamoin, which is a quartz stone that people would put in the burn in the stream, which would reflect the moonlight and attract salmon to a net. So and Robert McFarlane did a great thing by uh, writing about this place and he did the footwork, literally did his research. Um, and the mentioning crofters strapping dynamite to their tractors and driving into turbines, um, just started thinking like crofters would make such a great guerrilla army. So I kind of started making a combat fatigue for them and experimenting with ideas on how to do that. So this is using damsel flies and the shape of the mud and locks as camouflage. It probably wouldn't hide them for all that long. It'd probably be better to use tweed, but it was fun trying. And this is from a more recent project. So whilst I haven't actually um, revisited the kind of politics of this time much, uh, I've continued making work. This is for the kiosk project, which is showing at Atlanta at the moment, which is about spoof souvenirs and um, possible things from Highland and Island culture, such as a midge snow globe, which has, has been made as well. Um, so this is a, a kind of would be car air freshener, um, which I brought with me to Bergen because it smells so good and reminds me of home. And a final piece of artistic work I'm going to show is um, a piece that I've recently made also for kiosk which is going back to what I mentioned about the Moor being a place where teenagers would first meet. And I was talking with a historian who'd been looking at uh, marriage records. The Sheeling territories overlap uh, in different places where the different sides of the island would meet in summertime. And we kind of speculated that how some of those marriages might have occurred from first love out on the Moor. But also the routes that you would take walking between the shillings. So where you see the word Ari, that's a summer house. Um, and how they would meet up on summer nights, and possibly sometime later, a marriage would come from that first love. Um, and I just like the mixing of a more urban schematic with a very oral kind of historical uh, concept. I think finally, just to mention that um, despite the Land Reform Act and the AMEC scheme, which was turned down in 2008, the, there is still a, a movement with uh, Lewis Windpower and EDF, a French company, to build a wind farm on on Blanket Bog in Lewis, um, opposing um, four communities on the island who are wanting to build their own wind turbine for their communities. And at the moment, it looks like the consortium are going to be able to do that. They put in a, a hostile application, um, which looks like is going to be uh, accepted. So kind of capitalism over community well-being. Um, looks like it's going to went through but also i suppose to say from the 2004 campaign with the application being rejected the labor mp the labor msp 
um, both lost their seats. I mean, this isn't party political, it's just uh, the fact that they supported the scheme at the time. And the Labour government uh, lost their parliament majority by one seat. So it was great to see how grassroots activism could actually take on quite a lot of big organisations and people and, and actually win. So hopefully there's some hope for these kinds of things. I think that's that's all to say just now. Um, and just really ask if anyone has questions. Yeah, I think if anyone has a direct question, um, we're um, quite a small group, so I think, or not a large group, so I think you can just go ahead and, and unmute yourselves. If you have any, also a response, it doesn't have to be a question, uh, directly to what John's been speaking about. I just wanted to say that I especially love this underground map, especially I think kind of peatlands being like largely underground, the underground of course being like that as well. It's got a lot of wonderful symbolism. Um, does anybody want to say anything specifically now? Otherwise, I think we can return to some of these topics in the discussion a bit later. So I think specifically the language, I think we'll probably touch upon a bit later as well on the power of language. Um, Kieran, I don't know if you want to write in the chat or if you want to make a response unmuting yourself. Don't feel obligated because I'm putting you on the on the spot. Or Kate, if you also want to. Oh, sorry. OK. Yeah, cool, Kieran. Don't worry. Um, OK, so technical slash linguistic question we have. Um, what is a hostile application? Uh, Michael, I believe, is responding to Kieran. So let's go ahead with that question from Kate for now. Um, what is a hostile application? Um, well, I think I think it's uh, an application that has gone through without the um, full uh, reading of that application. I think it's something like that. I'm not 100% sure. I've just been reading the Stornoway Gazette back issues, and that that's the case that the Lewis Wind Pine EDF scheme it was it's all about the interconnector coming to lewis so i mean here in norway and in scandinavia if this was you know they would be powering the isle of lewis and harris with renewable energy first and exporting it second in the uk it's all about putting in the interconnector because there's so much money to be made it's capitalism steering renewables that's the problem really so these small schemes have been defeated by the big lobbies and the need to to make an interconnector. Um, and actually speaking about that, when you were um, speaking a bit a bit at the beginning about kind of the huge infrastructure needed for the large turbines, I was already thinking a little bit about how it could be done on a more community based level. And surely then, of course, yeah, putting primarily the local community and their energy source first, you would need way less infrastructure, right? So has there also been quite a bit of research into how much concrete would be required then roads all of this kind of stuff and like the difference between what's required on such an industrial level versus kind of really localized sourced energy totally yeah yeah but whether so they do, yeah whether common sense will prevail i think is kind of unlikely i think in the uk but who knows um and is there a date for that actually um for Kind of when this decision may be made again or announced or anything um i think it's it's pretty it's pretty imminent i think it's uh, probably this year and sorry i'm just now asking if anybody wants to put in just go for it and is the community again running running some campaigns against this similar to in 2004 and this kind of thing or or it's primarily now the counter application that they've made yeah, it's a counter application. It's um, different communities to the one I'm I'm uh, living in. So it's on the other side of the island, but um, it kind of really flies in the face of the Land Reform Act, where you know communities, because you know the highlands and islands are under a feudal system or have been for a long time, like crofters are tenant farmers. So to have the right to own your own land is fairly recent, like on the Isle of Egg or Assent, mm -hmm. and um, we are now a community buyout as well. Um, so it's uh, land reform in Scotland is 
got a bit of catching up to do. And I jump in. Yeah, go for it, Kate. Absolutely. Well, I put in the chat that thank you, John, for giving the details which make them all come to life, even on a, a wee Zoom screen. Because with the photographs and the descriptions and the involvement of artists, it made the issues um, so much more palpable, so much more something you could sense. And the attention to language is, is just such a great way in. And that's why I was alarmed by the phrase a hostile application in my head that could be a, a title for a piece of work that you could make but thank you for your explanation and thank you for the presentation you're welcome okay great so maybe if there are other things that come up or issues that we want to um, delve into a little bit later then we can do that and otherwise i would pass then over to uh lewis if you want to go ahead as well. Yes, great. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that presentation, John. Thanks so much for that. And I think there's some interesting overlaps with the things I want to talk about as well, which is exciting to explore. Uh, I also have some slides which I bring up. Hopefully you can see that okay. Um, so I suppose I'm going to take a slightly different perspective. I'm, I'm going to talk about some two examples each of arts led approaches to beat and then wind power and then try and do a bit of compare and contrast and think about uh, what these different projects can learn from each other and uh, the ways that they potentially interact or overlap. Um, first, um, just a little bit of <laughs> content about what, what we're going to go through. So I'll just do a quick intro and I'll talk a bit about peat with two case studies. Then I'll talk a bit about wind power with two case studies, and then I'll try and bring things together into a beautiful synthesis at the end. So I work for a charity called Creative Carbon Scotland. We are a charity working on the roles of arts and culture for addressing the climate emergency in Scotland. We have been going for 10 years. This is our 10th anniversary year, excitingly. And we do all sorts of different things, but pretty much everything we do falls into two different categories, um, which are sort of mutually reinforcing. And I think having one of those categories doesn't make sense without the other. So the first one we tend to call transformation of culture, and that's about helping make the cultural sector, the cultural industries in Scotland, run in the most environmentally sustainable ways that they can. So that's doing research and kind of offering advice and support on things like reducing emissions from travel or energy usage or buildings or waste or any of the practical things that come up through the, the running of an arts organization like a, a theater or a, a music group or what have you. Um, Part of that is the Green Arts Initiative. So that's a network of, I think now over 300 different arts organizations of varying kinds across Scotland that have all pledged to work on improving their environmental impact. So that's one side of what we do, which is I suppose, yeah, really focused on the practicalities of how do we make art and continue making art in a way that continues to be, that can become environmentally sustainable. And then the other side of the work, which is where I, where, yeah, where my role is really focused, we call culture shift. And I suppose that's looking at the roles that arts and culture can have in terms of bringing about the wider shift that we need to see in Scotland. So it's important that us working in the arts sector do our bit to, to kind of tackle climate change in the ways that we can within our own work. But it's important to recognize that there's a limit to what can be done within the sector, but that we also potentially have this powerful role to influence change more broadly across Scotland, and that this is something that arts and culture ought to be quite well placed to do, and that the vast majority of people living in Scotland engage with the arts in some form. We have all sorts of um, very public facing organizations and institutions that are looking to reach people emotionally, intellectually in various ways. 
So it's about trying to uh, maximize that role that the arts can have. And um, we do that in varying different ways. So we set up projects pairing artists with environmental organizations. Um, we're doing a lot of work around COP26 at the moment in communicating different arts and culture work around that. And I suppose this element of work is much more broad and undefined and open, I think is the, the, the foil for the more practical work that's done under the transformation of culture. So I suppose we try and find a balance between these two different things, which I think are both equally important and you can't have one without the other. But because I work on the culture shift side, that's what I'm going to focus on today. And a big aspect of that, which is really the basis for this presentation is something called the Library of Creative Sustainability. So this is a resource that we host on our website, which is a set of case studies about projects from uh, across Scotland and the UK mainly, but also around the world, uh, which have brought together artists or creative practitioners as part of environmental sustainability projects of varying kinds. Um, so it's basically uh, for inspiration. You can see the amazing things that other people have done, but it's also very practical, hopefully. So this is a resource which uh, we hope you can read a couple of articles about projects that were done. And you'd know after reading something about how you could do a similar project or a similar type of work yourself. So um, this library was in initially started as something for us, as a way that we could learn about effective arts-led approaches to tackling climate change, but it's now become a public facing thing. So it's available on our website for anyone to access and use. And we're always looking for more examples. But the case studies I'm using in this presentation come from the library. So you can also find out more about them there as I'm only really giving a, a flavor today. So why do the arts have a role in peak restoration? I think there are a few uh, arguments for this, some of which John has covered already. Um, one that's often talked about is Pete's image problem, the fact that Pete isn't seen as sexy. Um, I think the, the phrase image problem was used um, to be in conversation with someone working at Flow Country, um, which is this huge um, area of peatland up in the, the north of the Highlands, um, pictured there on the left. Um, basically this idea that Pete is kind of seen as wasteland or empty land or unproductive land and isn't seen as having the same aesthetic appeal as say the the uh, Scotland's mountains which is you know a lot of Scotland's national parks are focused on mountains and a lot of us today quite naturally just have this sense that mountains are these kind of beautiful aesthetically pleasing places where we deliberately go to enjoy ourselves you know people in the cities in Scotland will go out into the mountains um, to walk up and down steep slopes because that's seen culturally and socially as something that's uh, fun and valuable but there's not necessarily an innate human reason why we think that mountains are good and don't think that peat bogs are good that's something that's come about for various social and cultural reasons I think that's something I'm quite interested in is uh, yeah why we have how we've managed to create this very positive sense of mountain landscapes um, and I think one interesting example is pictured on the right. So this is an image of uh, Yellowstone uh, National Park by a painter called Thomas Moran. And this is quite an interesting example because these paint, this painting among a whole series that he did played a really significant part in actually getting Yellowstone made a national park. So when the, dis the discussions were happening in the US Congress about the formation of this first national park, uh, these paintings were hung on the walls uh, by the, the people who were in favor of the national park being created. And arguably these paintings and other prints that the same artist did had a significant role in creating a certain sense of these places as being of immense aesthetic value that then led to them being created as national parks. Um, and I think just comparing this image of uh, uh, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone next to that photo of the, the flow country, you can kind of pick up some similarities, this sense of a huge open space, the mixing of the, the, the land and the water, a rim of sky across the top. And it makes me think, you know, there's no 
necessary reason why we can't see peat bogs in the same light as we do these sort of mountain scapes. Um, that's something that the role that art can play a role in bringing about. Um, so that's one thing that strikes me. And then a few other things, the importance of participation. So I think this is something that John has highlighted already that um, when we're trying to restore and preserve peat bogs, it's important that the people living close to those places can participate in the, the process, so in the policy, um, but also in the, the process of actually looking after the peat bogs themselves, if they're farmers or other people who look after the land. And artists or arts led approaches can play a role in creating spaces for discussion, uh, bringing people together for consultation or other talks in a way that can be tricky. Uh, it's often difficult to get people into a space to discuss something which is either a contentious issue or potentially something they think doesn't matter to them. And there's a lot of good examples of the arts being used as a way to draw people into these discussions, which I'll highlight in just a moment. Another thing that, that I think is significant is about remote locations and awareness that uh, a lot of peat bogs in Scotland are situated in areas which are considered remote uh, <laughs> compared to the, the centre, which is often seen as, you know, the Edinburgh, Glasgow, the central belt area. And obviously there's a lot of politics in where we see as the centre and where we see as the periphery. But um, the arts can be a powerful way of bringing an awareness of locations like the Flow Country, which are really a very long distance away from Edinburgh to people living in cities. And those are often people who are policymakers and have this role in deciding what Scotland land will be used for. And then finally, just thinking about different types of value. So peat bogs have this immense practical value, as has already been discussed, but they also have you know, a cultural and, and aesthetic value and often we see these things as being in opposition so, you know mountains are seen as beautiful places they're also you know a source of minerals that, that can be mined or quarried for and these two types of value are very much in opposition but in the case of peat bogs places that we want to restore and keep safe from being altered in that sense the practical and aesthetic value go hand in hand i think we can um, make more of that as artists, how those things can work together. So I'm going to highlight a couple of, I think, good examples of projects that have played a role in peat restoration. So the first one is peat cultures. Uh, we're lucky enough to have Kate Foster here now, so I think she'll be able to talk more about this project in the discussion, but I'm just going to say a bit about it from my perspective. So this was a project based in Galloway in the south of Scotland. Um, as part of a wider program of peatland restoration um, by the Gallery Glens Landscape Partnership and the Crichton Carbon Centre. Um, and that was, you know, practical work about how to uh, restore uh, damaged peat bogs and ensure that uh, peat bogs that were, had been kept pretty safe continue to be. Um, but they were quite aware that they needed this artist role as a way of getting more participation from local residents and more support for the work they were doing in general. Um, so this was the role that Kate took on um, and she had a huge number of different things as part of it, which I'm only going to highlight some of them. But I think just probably the most important thing to highlight about this project is the time scale. So Kate spent three years on this project. This wasn't a situation where an artist was parachuted in to create a work of art and then disappeared. A, a huge element of it was building relationships with people, um, getting to understand how people felt about the place, getting to understand the landscape. And al although Kate did create you know, pieces, works of art as part of this, that was only one element of the, the wider project. A lot of it was about people and forming relationships. I think it's fair to say, look, I think Kate can talk more about this later on. So one element of that was taking people out for workshops and discussions and other sort of practical exercises in the peat bogs themselves. So these mixed uh, kind of scientific uh, work, looking at the, the different plants that were growing there, looking at the uh, kind of taking mud samples from the peat bogs alongside things like sketching and more kind of classically artistic pursuits that were kind of combined together, again, bringing together these different types of values, so the practical value and the aesthetic value together. Uh, Kate did things like producing prints, so 
she produced a series of prints which documented uh, the process of peat's restoration. But I think the nice thing about these prints was they were also made using mud from the peat bogs themselves as part of the printing process. So there's the kind of trace of the actual landscape, the place itself in these prints. And then the prints were used in various ways to reach people who perhaps weren't interested in going to the bogs themselves or were situated at distance from those. So they were made into an informational booklet, which was uh, printed and shared with various people. It was made into postcards, which were sold at things like local markets. Uh, there was a, a film made using these prints and various other things that I've probably forgotten. But there were these sort of long distance ways of drawing people into the project as well. So there was a blog, there was social media, uh, there were various ways people could participate without coming to the place itself as well, but through things like this peat-based printing process that still retained a trace of the place itself. And then there was this lovely, um, I think this was the sort of finale of the, the whole project, which was known as uh, sphagnum splat, sphagnum being the, the type of moss that grows in the peat bogs, which was quite a ceremonial event that took place. I think this was a silver flow peat bog, although Kate, you might be able to correct me. Uh, which involves you know banner making and music alongside this process of throwing these balls of um, uh, mud and uh, uh, moss seed into the peat bogs that would um, was kind of a fun thing to do with something that would literally help with the process of restoration at the same time. Um, that's yeah that's my perspective on this project I'm sure Kate will have other things to say in the discussion as well. It's always funny talking about uh, something from my perspective while the artist is in the room, but I know Kate is, <laughs> Kate's very friendly and intimidating. Um, this is another example which was based at the Flow Country called Flows to the Future, which was again a project trying to um, engage people with the, the protection and, and restoration of this absolutely huge and uh, uh, majestic peat bog based right up in the north of Scotland. Um, you can see that image there with the the visitor center that was built as part of this project. So again, trying to make it a place that people actually want to visit and, and see because it's a, it's a beautiful place. Um, and they worked with a bunch of different artists, one of whom was uh, Hannah Imlach, who produced a set of sculptures which were meant to be experienced in the landscape. And I think these are interesting in that they have this slightly sci-fi character to them. So. Um, I think you know one approach to peat bogs is kind of looking at history and the kind of the culture that's grown up around those places over centuries. Uh, another option is to look to the future and trying to imagine a sustainable way we can continue to relate to those places. And Hannah produced these quite playful sculptures, which all have sort of uh, um, sci-fi sounding names. I can't remember what this one's called. I think it was called something like Resonance Ombrometer or you know, it's, it's meant to sound like it's kind of measuring something, and some of them actually are kind of measuring things. Um, but they are these sort of, yeah, beautiful pieces which are kind of kind of positioned around the landscape as things for people to go and visit. Um, again, something to draw people to kind of experiencing the place uh, by literally being there. And then the kind of flip side of this was that they worked with cryptic, who are um, they're quite hard to, to define. They, they describe themselves as dazzling the senses. That's what they describe themselves as their purpose as being. But they work a lot with sound and music, um, which is quite hard to represent in the context of a presentation. Um, but I've just chosen this example by an artist called Kathy Hind, who um, was quite inspired by the bird calls and the, the, the sound she heard when visiting the, the peat bog itself and created this installation where there's these sort of concertina-like uh, creatures which are kind of hang from this tree and they um, open and close uh, with, the, with the wind and produce these kind of little sort of bird song like animal-like noises as you pass under them, which was her way of trying to replicate something of the sounds that she'd experienced in the peat bogs. And there were a bunch of other um, installations like that, some of which were just speakers literally replicating sounds from that place and they were exhibited first in the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh and then at the tramway in Glasgow so taking the sounds and experiences of the, the flow country peat bogs to the cities to people who probably may never have heard of this place don't really have a way to uh, relate to it in a, um, a 
personal or emotional or aesthetic way and you know providing that different way in that then provided a way to learn about the place so move on to talking about wind power so i think a lot of the justification for the arts and role in wind power um john's touched on these as well but i think there's a lot of similarities with peat bogs so you know renewable infrastructure has to some extent an image problem also that they're not necessarily seen as beautiful things um there's a lot of issues with how you know there's a lot of wind farms in Scotland and how those relate to the landscape and how they change it and how we understand that, which I think have to be dealt with in a meaningful way. Um, so I think there's sort of two sides to that, you know, that the arts can play a role in helping us to value renewable infrastructure um, and see it as something that's aesthetically worthwhile, but also, you know, responding in a meaningful way to real concerns people have to how, you know, wind farms drastically alter the landscapes and what that means for how we see and perceive it that that's you know something that we have to deal with and that we can't just brush under the carpet and when we yeah make this really huge change to the whole energy landscape but literally in Scotland and I think one element of that is this concept of sacrifice zones which is a term that Naomi Klein coined which I think really applies in the context of wind farm infrastructure that you know they're primarily serving people living in the cities where the most energy usage is, but they're primarily built in rural areas, which were effectively sacrificing in some way um, by doing that. And I think, again, arts as part of a, a consultation process or a way to draw out debate can be an important part of that. And, and yeah, as touched on already, uh, for creating an understanding of landscape in place. So when we build new renewable infrastructure like wind farms, we have to understand that it's not just a case of practicalities or, or what are seen as practicalities of you know where it can be built and how and um it's its purpose in, in generating electricity but it's also about how it, it really does literally change the places where it's built it changes people's perception of it people who may have lived there for generations um it changes how the local ecosystem functions and we need to have spaces to be able to do that in a meaningful way um, and part of this can be through things like the consultation feedback process, which is uh, not ideal in many ways. And a few artists are kind of trying to grapple with that process and how it can be improved from a, a kind of creative angle. Um, and my first case study on this is really an example of that. So this was a project between two artists called Joe Hodges and Robbie Coleman, who uh, collaborated with a social sciences researcher um on this project called a new environmental impact assessment so they deliberately chose this quite technical sounding name which essentially uh replicates the process for uh what happens when a new wind farm is proposed it has to go through an environmental impact assessment which is meant to look at how it will alter the place what it will mean for bird populations what it will mean for um how the landscape is altered so that is engaged with to an extent, but they felt that it wasn't done sufficiently in particular, it wasn't done enough about what it would mean for people and how they understood the place. So they sought to develop a new and more participatory way of carrying out these environmental impact assessments that would work with local inhabitants. So they worked with residents of a very small hamlet, I think of no more than, okay. 30 people or something like that that was situated very quite close to the site for proposed new wind farm development again in Galloway interestingly um, and did over quite an extended period over about a year did a series of talks and workshops and sessions with those people um, trying to gain a really full understanding of how they related to that landscape that place as individuals and as a community and what that might mean for the planning process and how actually a planning process could uh, really take into account people's uh, people's own relationship with the place is something which is really important but that there's not really space for in the planning process at the moment and they did a series of exercises with people so that it started off quite simple with just getting people to write uh, when they had moved to the place or how long they'd been there and what it meant to them then kind of doing a process of mapping and recording important places in the area 
um, getting people to take photos, getting people to take walks and record what they saw, and then moving into what the wind farm development would mean for them. So um, they did a whole series of quite, uh, I suppose, quite humorously looking at different things that might be installed in the landscape and what it, how they would feel about that. So including a wind farm or a single wind turbine, but also a forest or a sculpture or um, I think um, a spaceport or various kind of outlandish things. And although <laughs> the spaceport maybe not has not become not so outlandish in recent years, um, and kind of seeing how people would relate to that. And it was something that the local residents really took to. They, there was this kind of exhibit at the end, kind of showing all the different responses, which were portrayed in quite this scientific way with graphs and maps but actually sought to find a way of recording quite personal things about people's lives and their relationship with the place. And then the whole thing was put together into this sort of uh, um, booklet and guide, which was then submitted to various policy officials and uh, shared through various channels as kind of an, an example or a provocation for how the whole process could be different and kinder perhaps. And I think that the planning permission for that wind farm is still forthcoming. I think that's there's still a, a process going on there. And then second kind of contrasting example to that is the, the land art generator initiative. So this is why well, you can kind of see it summed up there in their own logo. That it's basically trying to find ways to create public art, which also functions as renewable energy infrastructure and contributes to making uh, to kind of place making and making um, cities or wherever it's built good places to live. Um, this is a global thing. It happens, like, it's happened in various major cities. There was a Glasgow instalment. It was a, a scaled down version. So rather than a plan to actually build um, a new installation, it was, it was a more playful opportunity to think about what could be done. And they invited various collaborations between artists and engineers working in renewable infrastructure to think about how a, a site in Glasgow could become a place for a wind farm and what that might look like. So um, responses looked like this. This was one of them. I think the artists were um, DL and Scullion, who are two, I think, Dundee-based artists. Um, and they proposed this option, which is based on technology that really exists, where this functions as a wind farm and that these poles wobble with the wind. Uh, and the vibrations kind of work to generate electricity. And they're also very beautiful, which, you know, is, is important and as humans, we, we appreciate and need beauty and kind of it's um, a playful way, I suppose, of trying to bring those together. And then some of them, uh, some of the <laughs> proposals were even more deliberately outlandish, outlandish and crazy. And this was another option with all these sales, making this sort of, uh, uh, dandelion clock type structure with a kind of visitor center at the bottom where people could um, learn about uh, renewable energy. Um, so in, in a sense, it's kind of a sad project in that none of these things could actually be built because there wasn't money to do them, but it was a chance to play and think about the ways that we think about wind power and renewable energy could be drastically different, could be uh, city-based rather than rural-based. And also in a lot of the proposal they received could be community owned rather than something that's um, in industrial or business operated, which I think is something significant that um, John's brought up already. So finally, what can they learn from each other? I think there are, are a bunch of interesting overlaps here, I think many of which are apparent that the, the situations of peat bogs and wind farms both have a lot to do with perception and aesthetics. So, um, you know, we need to um, learn to love and, and cherish our peat bogs and, and potentially see them in a different way to the way that we have for a long time. Um, we probably need to learn to love uh, wind farms as well and, and learn to kind of find aesthetics in those too. Um, both examples, urban rural divides, stick out really significantly in terms of often a lack of understanding between the needs of rural places um, from policymakers who are based in urban areas. Um, the importance to involve local residents in meaningful ways. So, um, in the case of peat bogs, you know the role people can have in helping to protect those. In the case of wind farms, actually listening to people living in places where wind farms are being built and see, yeah 
how, how they feel about it and, and what what can or ought to be done to adjust to their own needs and rather than imposing something um the importance of extended time frames so that these two projects pictured here both took place over a long time in, in the case of peak cultures over three years which i think is really significant for arts-led projects around environmental issues that uh, have been some very bad i think arts-led projects which have involved just kind of bringing in an artist to make a work of art in response to a place and then them disappearing again which is often i think ineffective and it, it, there's no space for developing understanding on the part of the artist but also no space to develop conversations or dialogue and, and i think a lot of the best arts-led projects around environmental issues that i've encountered are ones which perhaps don't even involve creating artworks at all it's about the artist coming in and playing this different role as a, a communicator or a provocateur, a provocateur or someone that can create new spaces of possibility that just wouldn't be there otherwise and then finally uncertainty and ambiguity i put that you know um in some climate change issues are really straightforward and we should resist attempts to overcomplicate them but there are also genuine um, complications in some cases things that are not straightforward um different issues that we have to weigh up against each other um and these yeah spaces of uncertainty and ambiguity are places where the arts traditionally thrive and i think that's you know a really powerful role that artists can have in places where there are kind of really contentious issues that people find it difficult to discuss or have many many different sides to them artists can help i think provide spaces that make that uncertainty a bit easier to discuss or or even embrace so those are some thoughts from me and um, yeah interested to hear what other people think um and that's it that's the end of my presentation thanks very much for listening thanks so much Lewis. um i'm just going to remove your spotlight and then we can go to whoever is speaking has a spotlight uh, i don't know if anybody has any direct responses to Lewis. they already want to go ahead and ask Otherwise, we would move a little bit onto the discussion part of the agenda. Um, so you can kind of unmute yourselves and go for it now if you want to ask anything in particular. Otherwise, I'm sure we come back to both John and Lewis uh, in the discussion as well, or their ideas that's spoken about. Um, I'll give you a little second. Otherwise, I might just start by pulling out a few of the ideas that I've kind of garnered from what you've said. And, Maybe somebody wants to unmute themselves and speak to one of those, or uh, if John and Lewis, if you want to expand on either of those. Um, so one of the things I was thinking a little bit about uh, was this idea of participation um, and kind of the, the connection between participation and language. And maybe that you were speaking, John, about um, uh, people, especially indigenous people, and then also they're now looking also at Gaelic people. Um, as being kind of, uh, the, there's a language tension there with living in a, in, a lang in a country where the language that's dominant is not your own or your native language and then also being that constantly infringed upon or banned or whatever form it may take. Uh, so then the power of language in participation and then that being understood by the dominant system and they try and ban the language, then reclaiming it as being a very powerful thing. Um, and Camilla, I know you're also here, so I'm wondering maybe at some point you might want to unmute yourself and also speak a little bit to that with the NSEOs project. Um, and then, of course, the Moreland Glossary also does this as well as the other projects that you were speaking about. Um, in the chat, there was also a little bit of talk around like wind farms and like where they're located, whether it's worth it. And I think a lot of that came down to um, questions around community versus capitalism or industrialism and how the wind farm actually is manifesting is it in either of those categories and this tension maybe between a sacrifice zone and people being seen as being um nimbies i don't know if you can make that plural but that kind of thing and um, which is a maybe also something that kate you want to speak to in a second uh, and finally i was seeing maybe a little bit of a um thing with the future and the past as well uh, with kind of maybe these new developments putting a disruption uh, between this like long-standing communities for example and then change yeah i should say to lewis just before changing the perception of how people felt 
um, and what actually ensures the future. More this kind of continuity from the uh, past or the kind of cutoff area. I don't know if all of this makes sense, but it's just a load of ideas that I've kind of gathered. And I would invite anybody who kind of wants to speak to any of those to just unmute yourselves and go ahead and, and share a comment and maybe we can just go from there. Um, so just go for it. If, you, if we talk over each other, then I also just invite someone to go first and someone to go second. Um, so I leave the floor to, to, to the rest of you now. Or put a star in the chat, we can also do that as well. Um, so either one of those options, if anybody wants to uh, speak to anything that we've just mentioned about, or any other points that you have as well. Camilla, yeah, go ahead. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Lewis and John. Uh, really, really very inspired by what you've presented. I feel also so much kinship with um, the ethics that both of you uh, displayed and discussed. Um, I am uh, speaking on behalf of a collective that I am part of called Insayos. And uh, we are uh, everywhere in the world, <laughs> but um, our hearts are in Tierra del Fuego. So uh, as you talked to John, I looked up um, Lewis because I wasn't quite sure where it was. <laughs> um, and the island of Tierra del Fuego, I don't know if all of you might need to look it up as well, uh, but it's part of the archipelago at the southernmost tip of South America. And it also has um, some of the, uh, the most pristine peatlands of the southern cone. So um, the landscapes different but, uh, but connected. And, um, and just to refer to what you brought up, Bethany, in terms of language, um, we within Sayos have been for 11 years focusing on different, uh, on different issues that, that come up for the communities in Tierra del Fuego. And um, peatland conservation has come forth in the last three years, with a with a lot of uh, with a lot of strength, not because um, it's being threatened like it was in in your case, John, but more because there was an opportunity to write it into new legislation um, so that it can be protected. So um, maybe the difference with the kind of work that we're doing right now. Is, and the, the work that you had to do is that we're not having to resist something, we can, we can actually um, propose something quite positive uh, for the future. And, um, but our approaches are similar in that we are working also in the way that you mentioned, Lewis, with really uh, the, uh, working on the bad image <laughs> that Pete has or the non-image in the case of, of uh, a lot of the Patagonian peatlands where they're not known by uh, the people who live in the capitals because Chile and Argentina are such centralized countries. And so if you're not in Santiago or Buenos Aires, you don't really know um, about peatlands. And so uh, we've been working with language and we've been working with indigenous language too. Um, to really broaden our a way, a ways in which we value and understand the value of peat. Uh, so one way to decolonize ourselves from the, the values of peat that, uh, that so far have been detected by science and a lot of the science that is sort of capitalist driven as well, um, and, and to find these uh, more spiritual, more aesthetic uh, approaches to, to peat and its importance for uh, the, the well-being of, of human <laughs> sentiments and life and, and, uh, and dreaming. So I would love to share just, just three uh, posters that we just made um, and then I'll leave the floor uh, just as a little offering to, to you um, all and especially to John and Lewis and repeat for... Uh, I've made you co-host now, Camilla, so you should okay. be able to go ahead and do that. Um, let's see, which one should I start with? Okay, I'll start with the one in English. So we made, um, a, I would like to share them all together. Let me, let's start with that one. 
You get to see that? I can't quite, I've lost you. Yeah, we, we see it. And uh, it's a little bit cut off perhaps. Um, kind of the word good, I guess. Um, oh yeah, perfect, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, so we made three posters for an exhibition in Tenerife and um, and all of the drawings and the posters are, are community sourced as well. Uh, so they're all different microscopic and not so microscopic creatures that live uh, on the bog or in the bog. And, um, and um, just, you know, a really simple, playful bog is good. <laughs> um, because of course, all of the English speakers there know that usually bog down is, is such a, has this negative connotation. So just very simply trying to, to uh, flip the switch. And then I'd love to share um, the, the version of this in Spanish, which is a slightly different message, but it's all, let's see. Um, share screen, this one. Okay, share. Uh, do you see that one? So this yeah. one is actually a little bit more of a chant. It's a uh, agua carbono y lecera, vivan las turberas. Agua carbono y lecera, vivan las turberas. <laughs> and turberas is peat bugs in Spanish, and agua, I, I, I guess you all know, water, carbon. And leceras is a uh, is a very local Chilean word to say kind of funny things, the odd ones, um, those little scraps of things that kind of go unnoticed. Um, so this one's uh, kind of appealing to a kind of a humor and a playfulness and a curiosity that we want to inspire in people to find, to find out about some of these little miniature creatures. Uh, alive and not alive who are part of the bog. And then just the last one is um, indigenous. Ah, there we go. Uh, the Chol uh, Chol Tol. And Chol Chol is a peat bog in Shilknam. And Tol is heart. So this one is the heart of peat. And as I was telling Kate yesterday, um, we uh, in Salios is is learning Shilknam, uh, and Shilknam is a language that is uh, said to be extinct, but there are Shilknam people who are alive and well, and who have also been called extinct peoples. Um, so you know, de extinction does exist; it's a possibility, <laughs> and it's happening right now, and we're all learning thanks to. Um, different technologies, and some of them are dreaming technologies, how to pronounce uh, these words and how these words teach us about this land and the memory that it holds, especially in the deep memory of the bog bodies way down below, which we hope stay down there and they don't get mined up. <laughs> so that's what I would like to share, really, but really just in, 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 in gratitude for the work that you all are doing. Thanks, Camilla. That's really great to share. There was already some comments coming in, really loving the posters. Um, I'm wondering if anybody has anything that they want to go ahead with in terms of the discussion, or it can be questions, it can also be responses if you want to speak it rather than get putting it in the chat. Um, otherwise, make sure everyone's looking at the chat because there are some things coming in there. Um, you can just, yeah, put a star or just go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Give you a little bit of time. Everyone happy? You can also um, kind of do an unprecedented thing of being well in time, of course. Um, but if there are any final words, go for it. Um, uh, we also have a short video that we have made that um, uh, is about 
P-Fest, which I mentioned at the start, which is the festival that repeat holds uh, every year, or kind of, I don't know if I say that too ambitiously, but we have held it for two years already. Um, so we can also show that now, um, but perhaps it's better to kind of finish from this session first. And if you want to stay and watch the video, you can. Um, and otherwise, yeah, any final words, you can go ahead and say them. just spotlighted myself instead of you Camilla because I realized otherwise it's quite intense to keep having you on there. Um, I was just loving the text that I was reading so so much fun. <laughs> um, yeah this exchange would be really nice between Tierra del Fuego and Lewis. I also know of an artist in the Netherlands who is working, she's from the area and she's now studying uh, in Amsterdam and she also was bringing this connection of how do I connect my new homeland with my homeland and was finding peat as one of the ways to do that. So that would be really, I think, really nice, different regions uh, being brought together through, through a love of peat and, a, and a either desire to resist what's coming or to, or to enshrine protection. Um, so yeah, I mean, get in touch. And if anybody else wants to put their emails in the chat, like, or you want to send us a message about um, any of the stuff we've talked about here, um, we're always up for collaboration, but also to try and put people in touch if there are topics that you want to continue working on here um, or, or bigger projects that you want to do um, and you want to run an idea by us, we're always happy for that as well. And I suppose anybody who's putting their email in the chat, the same thing. Um, Kate, I saw you had a question. I'm just going to... Uh, find it again, unless you want to just say it. Uh, on about on Deary Swamp, um, and how art fed into that. Yeah, go ahead, Kate. Yeah, Adria oh. wrote in the chat, so I was asking her. Oh yeah, Kate. Maybe maybe I can respond to that question. Um, so on Deary Swamp is actually. Um, is actually a highland bog, um, one of the only quacking bogs in Nairobi and also in Kenya. Um, so there is, a, there is a tunnel that leads from it that drains into the Nairobi River. And Ondiri is now the source of most of Nairobi's urban um, population, is a source of water. So this is why it is so important to preserve it. So at this, um, at this tunnel, there was a space where the wall was just empty and it was just looking um, not so artistic, it looked bad. So I organized with some local artists, then we came and painted the, we came and painted the walls. And now um, apparently it attracted so much attention from the news media that the Minister of Environment came to the place and um, they discussed with the community and they learned of the challenges that are facing the swamp. And, um, and now it is uh, in the final stages of being gazetted as a national wetland. So this, if, if this goes um, on, it will be the first pitland in Kenya that is recognized as a wetland, which is a great win in this side of East Africa because most of these areas are just considered as wastelands and um, and people probably uh, overuse them for agriculture, um, which I understand because it is the rural population and most of them, they don't have um, enough uh, resources to go and buy like food from the supermarket. So this rural population is directly tied to this pitland areas. So um, this, is, this is just a brief, a, a very short summary of, of what is going on. Let me share uh, an image. Do you need to share your screen, Ava, or you'll put it in the chat? Because I can make you a co-host otherwise. Uh, I think I will put it in the chat. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Cool. Well, there you go. That's a, a great example of art making a difference in relation to the bar for sure. Um, okay. I think we'll wait for this image and then in the meantime if anybody has anything to say otherwise um i would start saying my thank yous to everyone 
Okay, so maybe we, yeah, you can just add it while we go here, uh, Ava. Um, thank you so much to everyone for coming. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a little bit maybe uh, as the other sessions are as well, something that we just want to put out there and have a conversation about um, and hopefully it leads to more conversations and more projects and initiatives and collaboration between us. Um, so I invite everyone to do that, also get in touch with us. Um, it's just a conversation we want to continue having um, and bringing in all of these nuances. Um, so yeah, thank you to John, Lewis, Camilla, Ava um, for sharing and to everyone else for, for commenting in the chat and um, all of your thoughts. Um, yeah, we maybe will share this uh, other video perhaps, so you can stay around for a second. Uh, and if you'd rather just watch it later on Twitter or something like that, then you're also very welcome to, um, to head off and I wish you a good evening. Um, so now I'm going to the video sharing. Um, should I share my screen or Frankie, would you like to do it? Me, okay, cool. <laughs> um, let's see if I have no embarrassing tabs open beforehand. Now just, or even the amount of tabs that I have open is already sometimes an embarrassment. Um, um, you're gonna have to give me a second. Uh, if you are heading off, then I understand at this point because it's gonna take me a second to find where the video is. Haha, ha, I've got it. Okay. Let's see. Share sound. Share. Oh, you do see all of my embarrassing uh, secondhand sales. Opening. Interactive. Pandisciplinary. Sublime. Non binary. Transcendent. Supporting. Widening. What were my impressions of Pete first? Like everyone else had to watch it through a rectangular screen. Pop Circle, the festival platform, was just one of the ways of making connections across the world in this crazy idea of a 24 hour global festival. There were so many connections in the morass and the melting fluidity of the ideas. Just so brilliant and I really felt the paradigm shift. Pete first gave me a tiny little insight, but an eye-opening insight in the even bigger world of peatlands, and uh, also made me realize that I really desperately have to be protected, and uh, nobody really knows about this issue, although all the solutions are there. So let's start right now. It made me think about the fact that so many people around the world have dedicated their lives to peatlands, which is such a nice kind of symbiosis. I learned that payments for polluted culture are at risk of not being included in the reformed cap. This year's beat fest, wow. This was a crazy, crazy adventure. Unfortunately, I was in the organizing team, so it was rather chaotic for me, but as far as I could be there, it was just amazing. I heard so many new things. I saw so many new inspiring and nice people. And I think many ideas were sparked from there. And I'm really grateful for all of the repeat team for organizing and everyone who joined us. Big thank you and give yourself a hug. On the fitting of Pitland restoration, in Uganda and the rest of the world. These are our experiences we got. The pit fest was very colorful, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Movements. Decisions. Decomposition. Imaginative. Queer. Indigenous. Unfixing. Closing up the cracks. Okay, so that was just a little bit of kind of 
um, commentary from people who attended Peakfest or were organizing it um, and their response to the festival. Uh, you can still see all of the videos. Um, uh, so if you want to, you can uh, go onto the Circle platform, otherwise just send us a message and we can organize that you get the link to watch those. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and have a good evening. Thanks for coming. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.